As we worship God, his word says in Romans 11, verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor, or who has first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing our first hymn to God's praise, number 54 in our hymn books. The Lord is King, lift up your voice, O earth and all you heavens rejoice. Number 54. Let us pray. Wonderful Father, we thank you that the Lord is King. We praise your name that you are on the throne. And at your right hand is your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is reigning. We thank you that you have said in your word that you have set your king, your son, on his holy hill of Zion. We praise your name, O Lord, that you have declared the decree. You have said to your son, you are my son. This day have I begotten you. We praise your name. We worship you. We come into your presence. We praise you for the fact that you are omnipotent. You are all-powerful. We thank you that there is nothing too difficult for you. We thank you, O Lord, that you have all resources at your disposal. We praise you that you are all powerful. Father, that should blow our minds. How can we begin to contemplate a being of all power? We are so limited in what we can do, but you are all powerful. We thank you, O Lord, for your greatness. And that's just a little area of your greatness. We praise you. We bless you that you had the power to make this world. We thank you that you spoke and it came into existence. You said, let there be light and there was light. We thank you that you spoke and things were made. 
All things were made by the Lord Jesus. And nothing was made that has been made without him. And we thank you, Lord, that he is the creator. And we praise you that the spirit was hovering over the waters. And he was the creator too. And the, you, the great triune God of our Bibles, we worship you. We thank you that you have made the world and that you have made us, mankind, in the pinnacle of your creation on the sixth day. And we thank you for your power. And Father, we thank you for your power, not only in creation, but in providence, as you've not only created this world, but you keep it going. We thank you that you sustain all things, your Son, by the word of his power. We praise you that he upholds all things, we thank you that in him all things consist, all things hold together. We thank you that this world keeps going and it hasn't collapsed in a mess because of the Lord Jesus' hand keeping it up and your power. And Father, we thank you for your power in sending your Son, the Lord Jesus, into this world. We thank you for the great, powerful God and the great, powerful Lord Jesus. And we Thank you that that omnipotence was displayed while he was on earth. We thank you for the way that he had those miracles. He walked on water. We thank you that he opened the eyes of the blind. He raised the dead to life such as Lazarus. And we thank you for the power of Jesus Christ. And we thank you that that power is still available and at work today. We thank you that you are still omnipotent. We thank you that you still reign. We praise you that at your side is the man of love himself, the Lord Jesus. And we praise you that he's there praying for us, interceding for us. We thank you that he ever lives. He's always living to make intercession for us. How we are so thankful that when he had finished that work you had given him to do, he sat down in completion by your right hand. And Father, we thank you that he'll come again. We don't know when that time will be. You've not specified it to us. We don't know that day or that hour, not even the angels know, but you know when you will cause your son to come again. And we thank you, Lord, that he will come in great power and in triumph and we praise you that he will usher in the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And Father, we thank you that that will be a day of tremendous rejoicing for your people, for those who are found in Christ. Then the dead in Christ will rise first. And we thank you that those who are living, who remain, will be caught up with the Lord and be forever with the Lord. We thank you, Lord that this life is not all that there is. And we praise you that the best is yet to be for your people in glory in heaven. We pray that you will cause us while on earth to be heavenly minded, to mind the things of the next world more than the things of this. Lord, may we set our mind and set our affections on things above where Christ is May our hearts, as it were, already be there. Lord, we pray. May our hearts rise where Christ has gone and where Christ is in glory. And Father, we pray for those who do not know you, that that day will be a day of terror, Lord, where we'll be eternally lost. Oh, Father, we pray that in your wrath you would remember mercy. And we ask for the vast majority of people who haven't thought or haven't, and acted upon their latter end. Oh Lord, we pray that you would work by your Spirit and that you would truly cause people to come to the safety of the Ark of Christ and that they would be safe in the Lord Jesus. Oh, be at work, Lord, even today, even as you have been so gracious down through the years and as you have saved many of us here this morning, we pray that you would work and save many even in our day, family, friends, work colleagues, people in this area. Lord, may you be at work. Help us then as we proceed through this service, because we pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Let us open our Bibles and we turn to Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. We're reading the whole of the chapter. It's on page 197 to page 198. Joshua chapter 6. And we'll read the whole of this chapter. Joshua chapter 6, beginning to read at verse 1. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war, You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. And the seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times. And the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn. And when you hear the sound of the trumpet that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. Then Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Proceed and march around the city, and let him who is armed advance before the ark of the Lord. So it was when Joshua had spoken to the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark advanced and blew the trumpets, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard came after the ark, while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. Now Joshua commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth, until the day I say to you, Shout, then you shall shout. So we had the ark of the Lord circle the city, going around it once. Then they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. Then seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them, but the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord, while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. And the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. So they did six days. But it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day only they marched around the city seven times. And the seventh time it happened when the priest blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction. It and all who are in it, only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all who were with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And you by all means abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things, and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord, They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted when the priest blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet. And the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city. Every man straight before him. And they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. 
But Joshua had said to the two men who had spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house, and from there bring out the woman and all that she has, as you swore to her. And the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. So they brought out all her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. But they burned the city and all that was in it with fire. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua spared Rahab the harlot, her father's household, and all that she had. So she dwells in Israel to this day, because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Then Joshua charged them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord who rises up and builds this city Jericho. He shall lay its foundation with his firstborn, and with his youngest he shall set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout all the country. We look to the Lord, don't we, to bless his word. Let's come and sing our second hymn on the sheet now. I played over the speakers. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's on the sheet. We stand to sing. remember what they got for Christmas or have you forgotten already anyone remember the things they got Josiah a toolkit wow there you go okay so any problems then obviously see Josiah and he can fix you 
<laughs> whether he knows what he's doing with the tools. <laughs> no, it's all right, it's fine. Anyone remember what you got or do you have just forgotten? A what kit? A soldier kit, there we go. So we'll be all right if someone invades us, won't we? <laughs> Anyone else remember what they got? Anyone else other than our family? Okay, well, I'll tell you what I got. In that November time, me watch stopped. <laughs> And so I say, I want a new watch. Anyone got a new watch for Christmas? So Lucy got me a new watch for Christmas. All right, it's great. I like this watch. I'm a bit enthusiastic. It tells the time, obviously. It's digital. Got all the date and everything else. And it's got different buttons. Oh, it's great. You get a watch. Anyone got a watch? No? Is your one all right then? Got a watch. It tells the time. We are bound by time, aren't we? No, we needed to get here for 10.30 this morning. We're bound by time. Well, the Bible says this. It is time to seek the Lord. It is time to seek the Lord. How many times do you look at a clock a day or a watch a day? Probably quite a few, isn't it? Quite a few. Bound by time. It's time to seek the Lord, isn't it? Time to seek the Lord. I've got a friend of mine who used to be a minister, who's retired, but before that he was a glazier. It's a smashing job. All right. And what he did, he had to work for a, for a man. He put some glass, I think, near around a clock. And that's what he said to the man. As he did the glass, he said, it's time to seek the Lord. It's time to seek the Lord. And it is time now to seek the Lord. Whatever you do with your time, oh, that you'd seek the Lord. It's time to seek the Lord. You look it up in Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. Let's come to prayer. Let's pray for John at Kingston. Let's continue to pray for Christine. It's lovely that Mary's here and recovered. Let's pray for Tony, shall we, as he recovers from his chest infection and everything else. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that in all that we do with our time, that we would seek you. Father, we ask that we would truly go after you. We pray, O oh Lord, for your help and your strength on your people. We thank you for them. We thank you for Christine. We pray for her at home. We ask, Lord, for your continued grace to be upon her. We thank you that the carers are coming in every day and the nurses regularly. We pray for her as the bone is through the x-rays healing. They can tell that. We thank you, Father. We pray for her. We ask that you would be near her as the days are long, as she just sits there and feels very inactive. But Lord, we pray that you would encourage our sister. Help her as she prays to you. Help her as she reads your word. May she find comfort by you speaking through your word to her. Thank you, Lord, for the answers to prayer for Mary. And thank you that she's so much better and here today. And we pray for your help upon her continually. May she be fully recovered soon. Father, we pray for Tony. We ask that you would be near to him at home, O oh Lord. We pray that he would truly, fully recover, be near him in his home this morning, and give him grace and give him mercy. Father, we also pray for John at Kingston. We pray that you would be near him. We pray for your blessing. Upon him, we ask that you give him safe travel over the M62 as he headed eastward this morning and then comes back later on tonight. Father, it's not an easy thing even for a younger man. We're traveling and preaching. Lord, we pray that you would just keep him safe and help him, Lord. We thank you for that church. We thank you for the many years that Dennis has been pastoring and laboring away in that place. We pray for them as they look for a pastor and many others on that east riding. We pray for Whitby who are looking, oh Lord. We ask for Pickering that will soon be looking as Willie Horsburgh retires. And Lord, we also ask for others in North Yorkshire for Thirsk. We pray for them as they're also looking for a pastor. And we pray for Leeds, for Tins Hill. Oh Lord, there are so many churches that are looking for ministers Father, your son has told us that we're to pray to you, the Lord of the harvest, to thrust out laborers. We're praying for laborers here. Lord, we can look at other countries, but actually, Lord, we need workers in our own country. We need laborers here. We're not tickety-boo, Lord. 
We're not going all great. And so we need you. And we pray that we would have laborers among us, even in this county of Yorkshire. Lord, we pray for the great needs that there are. Lord, we ask that you would provide for those needs because you are Yahweh Jireh, the Lord who provides. We also praise you for Carol. We thank you for her, Lord. We pray for a week today for her baptism as she passes through the waters of baptism as her family and friends are hoping to come. We look forward to it in anticipation. We pray for your hand of blessing to be on everything. We ask, Lord, for your help. May you keep the evil one away. He doesn't want to see next week happening. And he, Lord, will no doubt try and and muscle his way in somehow. Lord, we pray that we would resist him and that you would give grace to our sister and the family as they gather. May that be a time of tremendous witness in the Lord Jesus. And something, O Lord, that we can be encouraged about. Thank you for giving us encouragements. We pray for more of them. We pray that this would just be the start of great things that you can do. Make bare your arm, Lord. Come, we pray. Do us good in the preaching of your word in a few moments as well. Hear all these our prayers, because we pray them in the name, the lovely name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 791 is our next hymn. 791. God holds the key of all unknown, and I'm glad. If other hands should hold the key, or if he trusted it to me, I might be sad. 791. Well, it's been a while since we last looked at the book of Joshua, so we come back to it today. 
and we return to our studies through this lovely book by looking at Joshua chapter 6 that we read a few minutes ago. Joshua chapter 6, and we'll be looking at the whole of this particular chapter. And what is it about? Well, as you may have gathered, it's about the destruction of Jericho. What is this? It is a true historical account. It really did take place. It's not mythical. It's not legendary. It really is a factual historical account of the destruction of Jericho. Now, it's an event that happened many, many, many years ago. So the question that might be in your mind is, what relevance has Joshua chapter 6 got on my life today? Here am I, 21st century, we do things greatly differently to what they did then. So how is Joshua chapter 6 relevant? Well, there's a very simple lesson that we need to learn and relearn that comes out of Joshua and this chapter 6 of the destruction of Jericho. Now, what is this particular lesson? It's this, the Lord's ways are not our ways. How many times do we need to learn and relearn that lesson? We forget it so often, don't we? The Lord's ways are not our ways. Don't we love the fact that the word of God correlates? It dovetails together. It holds together from other parts, isn't it? And we compare scripture with scripture to come up with its intended meaning. And in Isaiah chapter 55, it says that as the heavens are high above the earth, So are my ways high above your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You think of it. What is the distance between the earth and the sky? Huge distance, isn't it? It's not a hair's breadth. It's not marginal. It's a huge, colossal distance, massive distance between the earth and the sky. And so it is between the Lord's ways and our ways. Huge distance. The Lord's ways are not our ways. And we've got to remember that in life, in all the different things that come upon us, to remember this vital lesson. Well, hold on to your seats because we've got six headings this morning. So let's try and whisk them a bit. Six headings. The Lord's ways are not our ways. First of all, we've got instruction. Then secondly, we've got covenant. Thirdly, we've got action. Fourthly, consecration. Fifthly, we've got fulfillment. And sixthly, admonition. I'll repeat them and explain them as we go on. So first of all, there is instruction. Instruction. Do you remember what's happened to the children of Israel thus far in the book of Joshua? Do you remember? Well, the children of Israel under their new leader, Joshua, has crossed over the river Jordan. The Lord has opened it up miraculously and the Israelites have gone on dry land, a bit like the Red Sea, onto the other side. In order to remember it, the Lord through Joshua and in obedience to the Lord's commands, they set up 12 stones in the place that they were to encamp at, a place called Gilgal, so that in years to come when children would see those stones, they would say, Mum, Dad, what are those stones about? And they'll be able to explain to them about how the Lord miraculously opened up the river Jordan. Joshua has been near Jericho because as soon as they crossed over the Jordan, that was not the end of their work. There would be the Canaanite nations that the Lord said you had to destroy. And one of them was Jericho, this imposing city with these huge walls. And Joshua, maybe he's thinking about what to do militarily, what strategy to use. And the commander of the army of the Lord comes to Joshua, the pre-incarnate appearance of the Son of God, and approaches Joshua. What an encouragement that must have been to Joshua as he's thinking about the enormity of the task ahead of him as he's thinking about the wars of Jericho, to actually have the Lord Jesus to come to him. What an encouragement that is. And isn't it the case when we have a monumental task ahead of us, or we're worried about a certain thing, that the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ comes close to us to reassure us, to encourage us in the way. 
Well, what was the state of Jericho? Well, we learn a little bit of this in chapter 2 when Joshua sent out the spies. But it's here said specifically at the beginning of chapter 6. What does that tell us? Now Jericho was securely shut up. It was really was shut up. In fact, in the Hebrew, there's a repetition of the word shut that's put there for emphasis. It really was shut up. It was more tight than, than, than a packet of food that you want to preserve or a tin. It was secure. None went out and none came in. It was very similar to when our nation is, is expecting at any moment, a, sadly, a terrorist attack. And it says, right, we've, we've upped it up. We're on high alert, high security, higher police presence, more security. We're on red alert. Well, that was just like Jericho. They were on red alert, waiting at any moment for the children of Israel to attack this city with just grounds kind of been done in a corner that the Israelites were there and they crossed over the wilderness, the river Jordan and onto the other side. And the Lord speaks to Joshua and he explains to Joshua his plan of attack, his military strategy. It wasn't up for Joshua to decide what was best. It wasn't going to be down to Joshua's innovation. It wasn't going to be because he was smart. And he was sagacious, and therefore, because of that, that's how they're going to take the city of Jericho. No, it was the Lord that explained the strategy about how to do it. Now, Joshua may have had some ideas before the commander of the army of the Lord showed up. He may have had some ideas about how to tackle this, but he had to rip them up. He had to put them in the bin, because it was the Lord's ways that mattered. And how often we've got ideas, haven't we? And we've got plans and we've got thoughts and we think we're going to do this and we think that this is the best way and some of those ideas are not wrong, by the way. But the Lord comes along and he says, it's my agenda. It's what I want that matters. It was the instruction of the Lord to Joshua. Joshua had to follow the ways of the Lord. If he didn't, they wouldn't take Jericho. You imagine if the Lord said, to Joshua, here are the plans. And Joshua said, well, uh, they're all right, but I don't really like them, so I'm just going to do my own thing. Well, they're not going to get anywhere. And we're not going to get anywhere if we just say, well, thank you, Lord, for giving us the instructions in your word, but I'm going to just put them to one side because I know best. No, 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 no. The Lord's told us how we're to live, isn't he? He's instructed us. You imagine going on a journey and you don't know where you go and you get the map and you get the site map or something like that. You say, I'm just going to ignore that. I'll just go my own way. It's going to get lost. And we would. The Lord gives the instructions. Now, what instructions did he give? Now, you might think they're a bit bizarre. And they are to us, humanly. What did they have to do? Well, there would be some men of war that would be at the front. There would be a procession round the walls of Jericho. The men would be at the front, the men of war. Then there would be seven priests bearing seven ram's horns, blowing these horns continually. Then there would be the Ark of the Covenant. And then afterwards, there would be a rear guard at the back with some more men of war. And what they had to do was to march around the city once. And that would be it for the day. And the second day, day two, they were to do exactly the same. And they were to do that for six whole days. Just march around the city once. Once a day for six days. And you might be thinking, well, what good's that going to do? How's that going to win the battle? How's that going to have victory? I mean, what good's that? You imagine the Israelites hearing this plan from Joshua. You imagine Joshua sitting down, the men of war, and saying, right, this is the strategy. This is how we're going to tackle the city of Jericho. What you've got to do is march around the walls once a day for six days, and on the seventh day, march around the walls seven times. You lost your senses, Joshua. I mean, what's good's this going to do? How is this going to evade the city? How is Jericho going to be destroyed with that strategy? Really, what good is this? But that was the Lord's strategy. 
That was what the Lord was going to do. So it was going to be successful. In fact, it was a done deal because the Lord said to Joshua, I have given Jericho into your hand. It's a perfect tense, which in the Hebrew means it's a past completed action. It's done. It's in the bag. It's sewn up, said the Lord. You have got Jericho. The king, the mighty men of valor, the lot. You've got it. Because it was the Lord's strategy. The Lord had said, that's what's going to happen. And that's what's going to happen. Because we don't trifle with the Lord's sovereignty. And so, that was the instruction. Once round the city, once a day, for six days, and the seventh day, seven times. You think, really? Humanly, how, what good's that going to do? But that was the Lord's way. And that's how the Lord works. And he works in that way where he strips back anything of man and anything of man's ways in order that he might get the glory. So that we realize this is nothing to do with the cleverness of mankind. It's him. It has to be him. He does do that. The Lord works in such a way so that it clearly it's of God. And sometimes he puts people into difficult situations and then only then does he bail them out. To show that it's clearly a work of himself. His ways are not our ways. There's a man and he wanted to go to India to be a missionary. His name was William Carey. You've probably heard of him. He's regarded as a huge man, hugely influential in the missionary movement. William Carey. Well, going to India, humanly speaking, for Carey was a big non-starter. He was allergic to the sun... Oh, India is massively warm. He was a shoemaker by profession. Now, in India, the caste system is, is a big thing. Massive thing for them. And anyone working with leather was regarded as the outcast of society. So for, for Carey, allergic to the sun in hot India, for a man who works among them, oh, what did you do when you were back in England? Yeah, I was a shoemaker. Humanly, it was, it was crackers. What, sending him out to India, what are you doing? We wouldn't entertain it. We'd say, you, you, you've scored two own goals before you started. What are you doing that for? But that was the Lord's way. And that's what the Lord wanted. And Kerry went out there. And the Lord used his ministry so greatly. Because the Lord's ways are not our ways. They're not. And they're not here. And they're not for us today. So there's instruction. Secondly, there's covenant. Now you may have noticed, as you read through this particular incident, that the Ark of the Covenant was mentioned quite a few times. Did you pick that up? When we looked at Joshua chapter 3, when they crossed over the River Jordan, do you remember that we had occasion to know that the Ark of the Covenant was prominent? It was those priests that would bear the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders with the, with the poles and they would be the ones that would put their feet into the water and then and only then would the waters open and the Ark of the Covenant was an important feature. Well, as it was then when they crossed over the River Jordan, so it is here in the destruction of Jericho. The Ark of the Covenant was an important feature. It was central. It's repeated so many times. Indeed, when it's related about the procession, look at verse 12, and Joshua rose early in the morning and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. Isn't it interesting that the ark of the Lord is mentioned first? That wouldn't be the first in the procession. The men of war would be the first in the procession. Then it would be the seven priests bearing the seven ram's horns, blowing those horns continually. And then it would be the ark of the covenant. And then it would be the rear guard. But the first thing that's mentioned there is the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And it's repeated often throughout this particular section. It was prominent. Now what does the Ark of the Covenant represent? After all, it was just a box of, of gold. But it symbolized something deep. What did it symbolize? It symbolized the presence of God. That's what it symbolized. They had the Lord's presence nearby. And that Ark of the Covenant would be there, central in that procession. And as they march around the city, the Ark of the Covenant that symbolized this is God's work. This is God's way. God's presence is with us. 
And so important for us to look for the Lord's presence. To look for the Lord to come among us. We don't have an Ark of the Covenant now, do we? We're living in New Testament days, in a different era. But the principle applies, doesn't it? That we have the presence of Almighty God with us. Isn't it an incredible thing to have the presence of God with you when you're doing God's work and you're doing it in God's way? To have his smile of approval. To have his smile of blessing. To have him coming upon what you're doing. Another missionary was a man called John Payton. Have you ever heard of John Payton? He went and ministered among cannibals, among wild people. And one time they were after him. And he was up a tree and they were there below, ready to kill him. And he said this, it was as if I was alone, yet not alone. I was alone, yet not alone. And how many times do we feel alone? And how many times do we feel the pressures upon us? Maybe not that as dramatic as John Payton was, but still having the trials and the pressures of life upon us. And we are alone, yet not alone. We have the presence of God with us. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And when we're seeking to be obedient, just like the children of Israel, and seeking to obey his his word as, as he's revealed it to us, we can be sure of his presence with us. And sometimes we've felt that near presence of God. Him close to us, particularly, especially in times of trial. There is covenant. Have you known the presence of God upon us? There's instruction. The Lord's ways are not our ways. Not not how we would do it. Not, I'm sure, how Joshua would do it. But they were the Lord's instructions. Then we've seen covenant. Thirdly, we see action. That's verses 12 to 16. Imagine this procession. It must have been quite a sight. Can you picture it in your mind's eye? Here we have all these men of war in the beginning. And then we have these these priests with these ram's horns blowing it continually once a day around the city. Seven times. Then the Ark of the Covenant that was carried by the priest. And then at the rear guard, at the back, more men of war. Can you imagine? Can you picture this, this sight? It must have been quite a sight. It must have been quite a sound, mustn't it? To have actually heard these trumpets. Can you imagine the sound rousing the attention of the people of Jericho? Imagine them looking over the wall. Looking at one another. What's going on here? What are they doing? Why are they marching round the city? Maybe once they might think, well, you know, that might be all right. They're perhaps looking and assessing how the wall is and whether there's any chinks where they can come in, but they do it again the second day. Maybe they're just double-checking. And then the third day, really? This is a bit odd, isn't it? And the fourth day, and the fifth day, and and up to the sixth day, and then the seventh day. Can you imagine them noticing going round seven times? What are they doing? Just keeping on marching round. Can you imagine if somebody wanted to take Canterbury or Chester, and all they did was just march round the city walls? Really? It must have taken faith and obedience for Joshua and the children of Israel to have actually carried out that command, which they did to the letter. And sometimes we look at the things of the word of God and humanly to our human mindset, we think, really? We think, really? Do I have to do that? How come I have to do that? That doesn't sit right with me. That's not a part of my normal way of thinking. In fact, they were not to make any noise except on the final time when Joshua was to say, shout, and then they were to shout. But before that, they were not to make any sounds. They were not to make any words. Again, that would be foreign to military strategy. What do you learn about in your history lessons about the wars? They make lots of noise. They want to intimidate the opposition, don't they? I want to be like the New Zealand rugbyers before they start their game with that hacker to, to put an imposing on the opposition, imposing on the opposition. Make them scared. Well, why don't they do that? But no, don't make a sound. I think, really? Well, that's not our way. But that was the Lord's way. And how many times can we see, even in our own lives, where the Lord has expected us to do something and we think, really? But that's been his way. Has been his strategy. And it means we've never got the work of the Lord sewn up. It means we can never second guess the Lord. I was first here 
And we did a week of evangelism. You might remember it. And we got 5,000, no, more. We got about 15,000 leaflets printed. And the blessing that came as a result of that, you know, was absolutely nothing to do with the leaflets. I learned a massive lesson. That, that you're serving the Lord over here and the Lord brings something over your shoulder that's completely different so that he gets the glory. We would have thought, ah, oh, it's going to be something through the leaflets. It's going to be something through the door to door. It's nothing to do with that. That's the way the Lord works. His ways are not our ways. He doesn't think as we think. He doesn't act as we act. He doesn't do it in the time scale we think he should do. He doesn't operate with the same watch as we do. Not at all. His ways are vastly different. And they were to then do this. They were did it. They marched around the city once a day, six days, seven times on the seventh day. And the interesting thing is, you may have picked it up in the reading, how many times they had the repetition of the word seven. Did you pick it up? How many days did they march around the city? Seven. Seventh day? Seven times. How many priests were there? Seven. How many horns did they have? Seven. That goes back to creation, doesn't it? With echoes that God made the world in six days. He rested on the seventh. And in scripture, seven denotes the number of completion. The number of perfection. Which is why 666 is fail, fail, fail. Because there's not complete. Seven is the number of, com of perfection. Seven. Completion. There'll be perfection in what God does. Because it was God's strategy. It was God's ways. Psalm 18, verse 38 says, As for God, his way is perfect. His way is perfect. As for God, his way is perfect. And although there are many mysteries to us, why does the Lord do what he does? Why doesn't the Lord do this, but he does that? Why when we expect him and even pray to him and say, Lord, can you do this? But, but he does something completely different. Why? Well, his ways are best. His ways are best. We trust him. We, we throw our all on him. Because his ways are complete ways. They're perfect ways. We are more than conquerors. But we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. We're not more than conquerors through our own strategies. We're conquerors, more than conquerors, through him who loved us, aren't we? So we've seen there's instruction. We've seen that there is covenant. We've seen that there is action. Fourthly, we see there's consecration. And here is where there's a pause in the story. Because Joshua is still speaking to the children of Israel. But there's a pause in, in the main story of what's going on. There's a parenthesis, there's a bit of a brackets, if you like, here in verses 17 to 21. Because what does Joshua do? He says, well, actually, there's going to be the destruction of the city of Jericho. But you must bear in mind that you shall not take anything out of Jericho. Not take any possessions for yourself. He says you are to stay clear, literally. You are to keep yourself against the accursed things. Not to take anything from yourself. You are to go there and see gold. And think, oh yeah, I wouldn't mind a bit of that. Fill their tunics with a bit of gold. And see nice garments. Yeah, and think, oh, I wouldn't mind a bit of that. They were not to do that. To put the gold, the precious metals, in other words, into the treasury of the house of the Lord, and they were not to take, they were not to keep, if you like, the accursed thing. The word keep there is the same word that's used when God put Adam and Eve in the garden to tend and keep it. It's a generic Hebrew word. And here it's used in that negative way. To stay clear, keep yourself clear from the accursed things. You are not to take it at all. Now you say, well, why not? I mean, at the end of the day, if they're going to be destroyed and, and this gold is left over and, this, and the nice clothing's left over, why not take a bit for yourself? I mean, what would be the harm of that, we might say? Well, Joshua is doing what the Lord told him to do. What did he say when Moses died? And, and there the Lord comes to Joshua and he says, Right, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written within it. For then you'll make your way prosperous and then you'll have good success. 
Joshua is doing that. He's speaking the law of the Lord. Because in the law, when Moses was around, and you can read it in Deuteronomy and chapter 7, verse 25 and 26, it specifically says there that when they took over these Canaanite nations, they were not to take anything for themselves. Nothing. They were accursed. And so by Joshua saying, do not take anything of the accursed things out of Jericho, he was obeying the law of the Lord. He was obeying God's word. That's what he was doing. And that's what he was conveying faithfully to the children of Israel. Don't take any of those accursed things. What does it mean to be accursed? Well, it means to be devoted to judgment. And you might think, hang on a minute. Why, when you read the book of Joshua, are these nations wiped out? It doesn't seem unfair. Well, hang on a minute. You have to remember that these Canaanite nations were not God-fearers. And when non-Christians come and say, oh, yeah, your God is vindictive. I mean, look at it. Canaanite nations were wiped out by Israel and God told them to do it. And he's not very gracious, is he? Well, remember that the Canaanite nations were wicked. And God gave them many, many, many years. Remember what he said to Abraham. The sins of the Amorites are not yet completed. He gave them grace upon grace upon grace, even way back in Abraham's time, for them to turn from their sins and to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when people come to judgment day and they say, well, it's not fair. How can a God of love send people to hell and all the rest of it? Hang on a minute. How many opportunities have people usually had to, to turn from their sin? He's been gracious. He's been head over heels in being gracious to people, hasn't he? been so merciful, so kind to people. And God had been so kind to the Canaanites. But still they refused to love the Lord. And so he has every justice to use the children of Israel as judgment against the Canaanite nations and against these people of Jericho. Don't touch any of the accursed things. Now again, you might say, well, what relevance has that got to me? That's all very good stuff. It's in the Bible, but how does that affect me? Why should the children of Israel not touch any of those accursed things? Why was it so serious? Well, partly because they would vex all of Israel and they would trouble Israel, as we'll see next time. But also because they were to be a holy people. They were to be a godly people. They were to be a pure people. And that's the principle we draw. The Bible says this, love not the world. Love not the world. All the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Now when it says world, it's not talking about the literal globe. It means in that context, things that are against God. A school lad is getting ready frantically for school. You've not known that, have you? And he wants his shirt. So he can't find his shirt in his wardrobe. He's got to get to school soon. And so he goes to the dirty laundry bin. And he pulls out a shirt and he says, Mum, is this all right? And Mum's still busy, as Mums often are. And she says this, If it's dodgy, it's dirty. If it's dodgy, it's dirty. Friends, if it's dodgy, it's dirty. And we shouldn't be having anything to do with it. We live in a sad world. We do. I just looked up BBC News, just looked at the newspaper headlines. That's all it was, the front page of the newspaper. Just two of them. The front page was disgusting. Absolutely disgusting, friends. I had to just turn it off straight away. That's just the headlines. That's just the front page. We live in a sick world. Nothing to do with that. Let's have separation from the world. No, 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 not living for the passing pleasures of sin for a season, isn't it? But living for him, the accursed things. Fifthly, we see fulfillment. Fulfillment. Now, this is where we get the issue about Rahab. She's been mentioned already, but specifically in verses 22 and 25. You remember Joshua in chapter 2? He sent out the two spies to see the lie of the land in Jericho. And Rahab had got it when all the others in the nation hadn't got it. She realized that God, he is God. 
And it shows that none are too bad to come to Christ. Whatever their sins are, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. And that God's grace flows wider, his kindness, than any one of our sins. And Rahab, she said, as I've shown you kindness, can you show me kindness and spare my life? So they said, yes, as long as you don't tell anybody, and as long as all your family come in one place, and you put a red cord in the window. And she did it automatically. As soon as they'd gone, red cord went into the window. And all that red cord speaks about what we sung earlier on, about the blood of Christ. All the while she had that red cord in the window, she's safe. And all the while we're under the blood of Christ, we're safe. The blood of the Lord Jesus is like a fortress that we run to for protection. The blood of Christ, the scarlet cord of his blood, as we place it, as it were, in the window of our soul before the Lord, and the Lord sees the blood, and we're spared. We're protected under that blood. Are you under Christ's blood? Have you come to Christ by what he's done at the cross of Calvary? And again, it wouldn't, is the gospel something we would ever dream of? The Lord's ways are not our ways. If it was down to us, we'd say, right, well, no, no, you, you, you've sinned, you, you lie in it, you've made your fault, you've got to get out of it. But is that God's way? God's way is that he sends his own son to come and live a life we could never live and to die on a cross and to shed his blood and to do it all for us and to give it as a gift, forgiveness of sins and peace with God. Isn't Christ kind? Isn't he so much not like us? So wonderful, isn't it? The Lord's ways are not our ways and we'd rather have it that way, wouldn't we? Wonderful fulfillment and the two young men, the spies, they go in and they get Rahab out and we're told that Rahab, an interesting note, lives in Israel to this day. Now why is he putting that in there? Because when you were to look at this event and when the first readers were to read this event and say, Really? Did did Jericho get taken like that? Did the walls really fall flat when Joshua said, shout on that seventh time, on that seventh day? They could just say this. Down the road lives Rahab. Just, Just a few tents along among us in our camp. You go and ask her. And she was living proof that all these events were true. It validated this incident. Rahab living among them, worshipping the true and living God. And that's what happens at conversion, isn't it? The Lord transforms people and and he works in their lives and they're born again by his spirit. So we've seen instruction, covenant, action, consecration, fulfillment. Sixthly, we see this, admonition. Joshua has this little admonition at the end. Joshua's, Joshua's been taken they followed the Lord's strategy. It's been utterly destroyed, Jericho. But the Lord has something else to say to the Israelites before he's done. And it's through Joshua. And we know because this incident is mentioned later on in, in a book called 1 Kings, chapter 16, and in verse 34. And it says, the word, according to the word of the Lord through Joshua. So this is the Lord's word through Joshua. And he says this, listen. Cursed be the man who raises up Jericho again. If anybody builds Jericho again, it couldn't be clearer. When he lays the foundation, his firstborn will die. And when he finishes and he puts the gates on, his lastborn will die. There was a time in Israel's history, in a very sinful time, Under a very wicked king, hardly surprising that this happened, under a wicked king. It was worse than all that went before him. And his name was King Ahab. And under his watch, there was a man who came from Bethel. What a contradiction, because that means house of God. And this particular man, his name was Hiel. Do you know what he did? He had the audacity, the plain audacity, to openly defy the word of God and to build Jericho again. And what happened? He laid, his first, laid the foundation and his firstborn died. And he, put, he built up the wall and he put the gates in place 
and his last born died. He trifled with the word of God. What open defiance to the Lord, wasn't it? Isn't that what we're living in today? Isn't the word of God relevant? And we live in days where there is open defiance to the living God. It's not even subtle anymore, is it? There is open defiance to the Lord. Just like this, that, that word of the Lord. It couldn't have been clearer, could it? Don't build up Jericho again. And yet they build up Jericho again. Oh, that would never tempt the Lord our God. His word is absolutely true. And here it proves it again. And how oh, that there wouldn't be open defiance. How we need the Lord to come in mercy, don't we? There are laws that get passed that are clearly against God and his word. A clearly anti-scriptural, isn't there? That there's a defiance. There's a rebellion against the things of God. How we need him to come again in, in power and his reviving spirit and to awaken life again and to set us again to be those who follow the word of God. His ways are not our ways. Let's learn that lesson. His ways are not our ways. And his thoughts are they're not our thoughts. Let's be in awe of God. Let's remember His ways. And let's trust them. Because His ways are best. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You and we praise You that Your ways are not our ways, Lord. And that as there is huge distance between the earth and the sky, they are the distance between Your ways and Your thoughts and our thoughts and our ways. Lord, we pray, that as we'll sing in a minute, teach us your way, O oh Lord. May we not go by our own way, but may we go by your way. We pray then, Lord, that you would please cause us to look at this issue of Joshua, for the things that were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the consolation of the Scriptures, might have hope. And we pray that we would learn that lesson maybe again, that your ways are not our ways. Help us therefore to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing our last hymn then. 807, as we said in the prayer. Teach me your way, O Lord. Teach me your way. Your gracious aid afford. Teach me your way. Help me to walk by faith. More by faith. Help me to walk aright. More by faith, less by sight. Lead me with heavenly light. Teach me. Your way, 807.
Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church, by Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever.